an axonometric image of a city that you might recognize by some of those lines. Um, we started this year asking the first year students to draw a line on the cover of the prospectus that each one was carrying as a way to understand how a line actually determines that position between an inside and an outside, between private and public, between here and there, between somewhere and nowhere. This position series was formulated with the aim to try to understand how do we position ourselves as a school, but also as individuals within the different discourses and agendas that are being distributed, produced, not only within architecture schools, but also within society as a whole. The way in which we have brought each one of the postgraduate programs and their directors with their alumni and students with what we call external figures or experts to try to articulate a position that somehow allows us to determine where we are going next, where we are going forward, is something that for me is very important. This first edition of the position series is, is called Forward. And there is no other option than forward. And yet we all know that that forward is always a look backwards, or as some people would say, always looking into that rear mirror that allows us to actually know where we are coming from. Um, I'm not going to make long introductions. I think what we really want to hear is what people have to say here today. I am very grateful for the uh, uh, H C T program with Marina and, uh, and with Platon Isaias with the Projective Cities, uh, sorry, <laughs> a, a, a project a postgraduate program to be here to try to articulate those positions and how we actually can all as a school position ourselves for, against, or in relationship with. I'm going to position myself as part of an OGM meeting, so that's probably the position in which I never thought I would find myself, that is to abandon the most interesting conversation in a school to probably go into the next. Um, but I do hope that that mechanism that we have in there is going to make this conversation something to very much look forward. So with that said, I want to introduce Manije, who actually is the head of public programs, who will make the proper introductions and not this thing that I just did, but I just want to thank all of you and all of you here. So thank you. Um, so just very briefly, because I'm sure we're all anxious to hear what our speakers have to say, I'm just going to quickly introduce our panel. Um, Platon Nasseas is the co-director of Projective Cities and unit master of Diploma 7, and he's here to kind of take forward this theme of forward on how we use the past and present to design cities for the future. Um, next to his left, Patricia Roy Canepa is um, an AA graduate from 2017. And she expanded her interest in kind of cataloging as a form of practice to um, then embark on a curatorial project to bring together a historical Arctic exhibition, expedition and a, a reenactment of that expedition by Oxford University students, which is what she'll be talking about this evening. Um, Sian Cheng, uh, next, is a graduate of both the Projective Cities program and the City as a Project PhD program. And uh, she's going to be talking about her current research project, Collective Forms, um, in China that challenges the Western-centric kind of understanding of um, urban design. Zoe Svensson um, designs participatory performances, such as the recent We Now Know, or We Know Now What We May Be at the Barbican Center. And she speculates on how economic and political systems can respond to change for the future through the medium of performance. Marie-Louise Rao um, is an AA graduate from 2015. Um, she currently works at Herzog and Demiron in Basel, but she's here tonight to talk about a self-initiated project called 100 Minds that inspired by historical conversations like Siam and uh, the Dadaists, or more recently, Ai Weiwei, she tried to reach out to her kind of friends and networks to encourage a new form of conversation, collaboration, and exchange. And last but not least, Marina Lathuri is the director of the History and Critical Thinking Program and is the author of the aptly titled City Cultures, Contemporary Positions on the City, among others. And she'll talk tonight about the power of words across time. So we're gonna kind of run in that order. Each speaker is gonna briefly state their position and then we will open it up to a, a wider conversation. And uh, stick around, there will be drinks afterwards to continue the conversation more informally. So please join me in welcoming tonight's speakers. Um, 
I mean, of course, I have no idea how to answer this question, right? I mean, um, I actually want to say a few things that are not necessarily related with the program or the diploma unit. Um, I, we had a conversation about what the program does uh, last week and when we all presented actually the different uh, graduate uh, programs uh, in the school. Um, so I, I just decided actually to throw a few ideas and I also selected five images that have, apart from one, um, have nothing to do with architecture, at least in the first place. So they are not drawings, they are no representations of architectural projects and they don't come from the program either. So I kind of messed up the whole event to start with. Um, first of all, I mean, I'm somehow reluctant to talk about the future because I think there's not one future, there are multiple futures, right? And I think uh, these are always a product of uh, social uh, conflicts and struggles, right, in the city. So I don't think that we can actually, even within a uh, kind of pedagogical framework to uh, agree, and that's actually a very good thing, uh, where to take the school or where to take architectural thought or where to do with architectural theory or how to do architecture at large. So we should first of all accept that there is not one future but multiple ones. And we should also accept that uh, whatever comes out of uh, this kind of uh, uh, power play of uh, different imaginations, uh, wouldn't uh, necessarily, actually, hopefully, wouldn't uh, make everyone happy. So we should somehow embrace the fact that we are producing uh, forms, typologies, thoughts, words, uh, images that are um, conflictual. You know, uh, so we shouldn't try to find the future. Maybe we should discuss what everyone believes about, you know, towards where we want to take something instead of just trying to embrace one common possibility. Now, the other thing that I want to say very briefly is that I am very much interested in the ways by which what we do in a way today distorts the past. So in a way, the past is never given, actually. The contemporary, the current production uh, re I mean, reorganizes uh, every uh, art product, every text, every word, every image that has been produced in the past. And I think uh, we actually, and that's some that I try to show with these uh, five images, quite often we work with uh, anachronisms. So we are displacing images, we are appropriating images, we are using archetypical, uh, let's say, uh, situations. For example, there is one painting by Kehin de Wille, uh, where in a way it imitates a painting by Jacques-Louis David, who is a, it's a representation of power, of course. It's Napoleon leading the army over the Alps, but in the case of Wille, it's actually a, a African-American male, right? So it's, a, again, a play with conflicts, with problems, with identities, uh, and with different imaginations. Um, I think I will leave it there for now. I also use a very safe image in my selection, which is, of course, the very famous painting by Claire, the Angelus Novus, um, and we come back to it. Okay, thank you. Hi, so I graduated a year ago and I went to architectural practice like most A students. And then I came across this film called Space Back and Retraced in which two Arctic expeditions to the, to the North Pole actually happened a century apart. So there was this film telling the story of, of how this came to be. And my position in this or my way forward in trying to understand what I could do as an architect after leaving the AA was uh, questioning the format, so the material was really interesting. I was asking myself what the media should be doing and how it should be communicated. So the whole uh, exhibition proposal curation came across as this uh, collaboration with the expedition members, telling them my my idea of how this should be shown. Um, and the expedition, art expedition is something I'm completely foreign to, so I became interested in being an outsider of uh, something that's very uh, built, and so I looked at scientific research and, uh, and how these things are shown generally, and by, by being outside of it, I think there's a, there's a room to play with other things. So as an architect, I think we come into the intersection of many disciplines, and I think in terms of going forward or my met methodology, it's an important thing to do to actually remove yourself from a comfort zone and actually look at things in a different way. 
I think this is why I came to London and this is why I also look back at home in a different way. There's how Eva was saying, there's the condition of looking, looking at the future is also looking at the past. So one of my images, actually this is my, my images. <laughs> so one of the photo, there's four photographs from Eladio Dieste, which is an architect from, from Uruguay, engineer, sorry, from Uruguay. And being here allowed me to see those buildings in a different way and actually uh, understand them from a different perspective. So I think this separation, either temporal, like Spitsbergen, so seeing one landscape through the lens of today and seeing a building from a different geographical point, like here in London, I think that uh, sort of allows a different way of traversing things or understanding things. And in terms of my approach or my interest in cataloging, I think it becomes relevant in the context of the references I've bu been building upon. So there's Walter Benjamin and George Sperek. Uh, and I think their methodology of being thorough and con constructing the present through the past. So Walter Benjamin was actually doing a catalog of his own life, which is pretty much what I'm attempting to do with 22 lists that I carry about everything I eat, every, everywhere I go, and everywhere I travel. So I think this kind of way of doing things is actually a temp uh, retracing of my own life in sort of real time. And I think it, it's building up to some somehow in the future look at my past and trying to understand certain things. So I, I think I don't really have a way forward. I'm just trying to build the present to somehow in the future be able to look at it in a different way. And maybe, yeah, the last thing is the importance for me of this removal of always becoming a bit of a stranger to looking at things in a different way. Are we at the podium or should I say something? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm Cyan and um, coincidentally that's actually my work. So um, for me, um, it's quite, it's a quite difficult question, like four words, it's quite a difficult word. So for me, four words is about like alternative ideas, directions, positions that depart from or challenge traditional norms. So it's unnecessarily to say we create or invent alternatives. I would rather say um, discover, acknowledge, or simply be aware of alternatives as they often exist and have just been um, simply overlooked. So I'll try to throw several pairs of terms to explain what I mean by this type of alternative. Um, the first is the public and the collective. So I think arguably the public space and the individual subjectivity are among the most predominant ideas in the Western conception. And individual subjectivity is something like fundamental to one's identity in society. And in this sense, a public space is for individual expression while addressing a larger society. But however, the individual in China is largely seen as a constituent part of a larger collective. So rather than a dialectic, so individual and collective are understood in a relational uniform, unified or associational terms. So in this sense, shared spaces are actually collective spaces, which just facilitates everyday activities for a group living closely around it, and through which the association between individuals and the collective are reinforced. So that, why this matters? Because we can see conventional public space are increasingly commercialized, homogenized, and dysfunctional. So maybe the Chinese collective Activity-based collective space can offer an important alternative to understanding how shared spaces can function. So the second pair, I would say, is the urban and the rural. Um, I think in the discourse of architecture, it wouldn't be going too far to say that the modern movement was largely aligned with the processes of industrialization and urbanization and thus has its roots in urbanity. While the rural is, however, considered not just economically, but also culturally and intellectually underdeveloped. So what is rurality? 
So in the Chinese context, rurality can be understood as an elastic form of association. But rurality is not about whether or not people live in the city or in the countryside. Rather, it's about a distinct form of living arrangements and social organization. So for example, the dissolved households emerging from families of China's floating population actually manifest a self-organized support system underpinned by associational relationships. So why this matters? Because we see today the disappearing nuclear family, the disappearing traditional idea of domesticity, as well as an aging society. So what arises is the need for intergenerational living and the need for new social networks of care. So in this sense, I argue, rurality actually anticipates some of these global discussions around alternative types of social relationships beyond the family norm. So these two um, aforementioned pairs of terms are closely related to my work. Um, the idea of the collective is from the project Collective Forms in China I am currently working on, and the idea of rurality is from my PhD thesis. But the third thing is, through working on these topics, I've gradually came to realize that actually how to put forward and move forward with critical positions are also different in the West and in China, which is a third pair of terms, confrontational, as in the West, and relational, as in China. But I won't expand on this. Um, so those comparisons are actually very, very simplistic. Um, maybe we can talk more during the discussion. But the idea is that to move forward, we need alternative discourses of architectural history, theory, and practice. So I just hope I touch a bit on one potential perspective derived from China. Thanks. Thank you. Um, that's it's really fascinating. I think we're having a conversation because a lot of what you're saying is um, something that in my work I'm sh we're trying to edge towards. Um, so I'm a theatre maker um, and a, a performance maker. Um, and in terms of thinking about going about forwardness, I'd say that my work is very much at the moment in the context of climate change. Um, and I, I often say I make work not about climate change, but in the context of. And in that context, it's a kind of mixed upness between past, present and future, both because of the speeds of occurrence of climate change. And I've been kind of thinking about this kind of thing for about um, 10 years now, and I think you'll probably have noticed my tragic or epic slide up there at some point, because it's rather large. Um, uh, and that's just by way of saying I come at it very much from a kind of set of questions around narrative rather than a sort of from a, I've, become, I've, I've moved towards environmentalism from the perspective of questioning who we are and who we might be in this context. Um, so there's speed, different speeds of awareness that complicate the question of what forward might mean, but also um, different speeds of occurrence. Um, and what I'm doing at the moment is trying to think about how we go about playing at the future in order to address some of these questions. And it's a very difficult question when it's such a serious matter. But I'm convinced that it's only through creating an imaginative space of play, through creating many futures, actually, a multiple, uh, a multiple relational space. That's why I was sort of interested in, in this question. Um, that's about re a re kind of radical redistribution of power um, that we can start to imagine our way forward. But then when I thought about this word forward, I thought there's something interesting about it and, and perhaps tricky, which is related to how we situate ourselves between the present and the future, where thinking forward implies a kind of predetermined goal, and if the conditions of the present are allowed to set the terms of the future, then we are, are limited in, our, in the space of, of the imagination. So the question is, how do you produce a gap that enables this kind of playfulness that then enables a, a space? And so this sort of coming back to that question of, you know, are we tragic or epic? Do we take the tragic form? Do we go down in flames and take the planet with us? Or are we on an epic journey where we can uh, take different forms forward and, uh, and move onwards into a future that we, we don't yet understand? Um, and I just, in, in relation to that, I just want to finish with a quote from Amitav Ghosh from his book of essays, the Great, the Great Derangement, which I highly recommend if you haven't come across it before. Um, 
because he's talking very much about how we might look back on the present from the perspective of the future. And he says, in a substantially altered world, when sea level rise has, has swallowed the suburbans and made cities like Kolkata, New York, and Bangkok uninhabitable, when readers and museum goers turn to the art and literature of our time, will they not look first and most urgently for traces and portents of the altered world of their inheritance? And when they fail to find them, what should they, what can they do other than to conclude that ours was a time when most forms of art and literature were drawn into the modes of concealment that prevented people from recognizing the realities of their plight? Quite possibly then, this era, which so congratulates itself on its self-awareness, will become to known as the time of the great derangement. Okay. Um, I would like to share with you a project um, I, initi I initiated together with my, with my partner called uh, 100 Minds. It was inspired by a set of books, the black, the white, and the gray cover books produced by Ai Weiwei, in which he asked artists to explain what was behind their activity. And the dissemination of these books in the mid-90s in China revealed a large underground network, basically, of contemporary artists at the time. And uh, in 2016, we sort of tried to do something similar by sending an email to 100 minds. And in our case, we were prompted by a deafening silence amongst architects, but also a lack of exchange between all of our closest friends whom are scattered all around the globe, following very different trajectories. Um, and we were also critical of the architecture profession and its uh, inherently competitive DNA, so we compete for university positions, we compete for projects, for competitions, to get projects, and as such we have increasingly become an isolated and fractured uh, profession. So in opposition to this trend, we sent the following email. Gmail inbox. Dear all, at critical moments in the last 100 years, people from all facets of life came together to discuss inquire and articulate points of view. In 1945, Roosevelt, Churchill and Stalin met at the Yalta Conference to discuss Europe's post-war reorganization. In 1933, Siam met to write the Athens Charter. And in 1916, the Dadaists initiated their counterculture movement. As an experiment, we'd like to conduct a survey of 100 minds in 2016 and we invite you to respond to the following three questions in the form of text or image. One, what preoccupies your mind right now? Number two, how would you define your daily encounter with the city? And three, can you describe the most vivid experience of a space you had this year? In the end, 57 people responded, which is a statement in itself. So we collected all the answers and composed the document, which we sent to all the contributors. And basically this record represents a collective thought at a very precise moment in time. And at the same time, it's also like a section cut through our profession and through people's consciousness. It includes, for example, prophetic statements regarding the Me Too debate, the US presidential elections in 2016, comments on the aftermath of the Brexit, but it also illustrates different readings of the city, from the map to the mediated, from the concrete to the abstracted, and also from the real to the digital. So people noted that we don't actually live in just one city, but many, many cities. We occupy many cities basically at the same time. And that speed, vantage point, and touch, be it your iPhone or the stranger in the tube, are means to experience the city. So to conclude, this year, we'd like to follow up on the 100 Minds by hosting a one-day event, hopefully at the AA. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> the, event will, the event will be entitled 99 Problems, and it will be an event solely, strictly about problems. The word problem stems from the Greek word pro balain. Pro means forward, and balain means to throw, so it's literally something you throw out there. There will be no answers no egos, and there will be no one-upmanship. 
moving on from the rather subjective and personal answers that we collected in the 100 minds, here we want to collect and classify rational, critical, and objective thinking. In a culture of rapid answering, of oversimplifications and uncompromising dichotomies, we want to conduct an experiment without answers and a project which thoroughly basically interrogates the complexity of problems. And in that sense, we are really looking forward to hearing your problems. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. And I would like to uh, conclude that part and um, pose a question for the start of the discussion, uh, which relates more to uh, the present rather than uh, the future or the past. Um, I think I'll return to many of the, of the things which uh, have been mentioned. It's how do we, and something that uh, Marie-Louise said, how do we respond to our time? And trying to think about that question, I um, revisited a text uh, which um, Agaben, George Agaben wrote, I believe in 2007, after a seminar he gave at the European Graduate School. And the title of the seminar was, uh, What is the Contemporary? And I thought that perhaps that's a question which uh, worth um, posing here, as a position within uh, our time, one's own time, and as a position um, towards the present. Um, so, I would like to say what, I would like to ask, what does it mean uh, to be contemporary? In uh, his text, uh, just to go to the, uh, one of the uh, quotes from the text, yes, thank you very much. Uh, Agaben writes that contemporariness is a singular relationship with one's own time, which adheres to it and at the same time keeps a distance from it. More precisely, it's that relationship with time that adheres to it through a disjunction and an anachronism, which goes also back to what Platon said at the very beginning. Um, in one way, Agaben was referring to yet another text, uh, the Atimely Meditations by Nietzsche in the late 19th century, where in that text Nietzsche tried to come to terms with his own time and situate himself within his own time. And what Atimely signified was exactly this uh, disjunction, this out of jointness, that means that one, the now, the present, is that threshold, is that moment, or is that un ungraspable um, place, or in between, uh, where we are located, and where we are at the same time in time, but also out in, in this time, but also out of time. And for Agaben and also for Nietzsche, to be out of time, to have that junction, means that one can be contemporary in the sense that one can hold again a gaze on his own time and then define that present. So that also means that someone, for Agaben, those who coincide too well with the epoch those who are perfectly tied to an epoch in every aspect, they are not contemporaries because they don't manage to see it. So what he poses here, and I think it's very important that in one way the, the now is that moment where we take a distance, a critical distance, in order to look at the present, and of course that particular relationship with the now, with the time, with the, our own time, also, um, establishes a particular relationship with other times, with uh, the past and possibly the future. And here where um, I would bring the role of history 
in one way, as also uh, Plato mentioned at the beginning, every time we look backward, every time we uh, try to read, examine histories, specific histories, of course, we produce yet another past. So we distort the past. It doesn't exist as such. So the present becomes this kind of encounter of multiple times and multiple places. Um, and this is where I see from my point of view, from my practice, as someone who deals mainly with text, mainly with uh, uh, that re um, writing of history, whatever that means. I mean, the question for me is how one can write history, uh, engage with history uh, today. In one, in one way, how um, that critical engagement with the past can uh, help us not understand the present and also possibly indicate directions of thought and directions of practice in the future. So I, I too agree that one cannot determine, predetermine the future. Uh, we cannot even project, but we can perhaps anticipate or we can open uh, up or break through um, existing words and existing histories. And in, in this sense, I would finish with uh, yet another um, thought from the text that the historical investigations, our examination of histories or history, our journey in time, uh, it's always guided by uh, the theoretical interrogation of the present. And that's, uh, that's the thing, the, the position one can perhaps take by situating oneself within that present in order to be able to investigate and um, uh, indicate or anticipate. Thank you. Great, well, thank you to all of you for um, fulfilling my very difficult brief of only speaking for a very short time about your position so that we can prioritize the conversation. Um, I, I think each of them were like a mini manifesto and I hope we get to expand on them in the discussion now to follow. Um, to kick off the conversation, I wanted to ask each of you about, I guess, across the six presentations, you were all talking about um, multiple pasts and multiple futures, um, these different binaries through which we can understand direct the ways forward, and also the design project of landscapes, cities, or even environments. But I was wondering how, when each of you work on these kind of these projects, how much you think of their future impact when designing the actual project itself. I think uh, maybe I can say a few things. I think um, for me, um, we unnecessarily consider future impact because, as I said, I think the key word for me is to find alternatives. So I think forward actually doesn't mean future to me. Mm -hmm. I think we can move forward just in the present. So that's why I don't think I, we've even considered the future impact. It's like to be at the present and to maybe look forward is also to look around and see what's around you, what, what's already there. And then that's like my understanding. Yeah, I think that links really well into what you were just saying, yeah. Marina, about mm -hmm. um, rather than thinking of the future, to think of the present as a kind of expanded territory yes. from which mm -hmm. we can stand back at a distance or yeah. um, kind of move forward within. But um, I was just curious then if we apply that kind of way of thinking to what each of you have talked about, how would you see this kind of territory of the present as a kind of productive space for you to work? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, maybe I didn't expand on that so much, but my whole exhibition, the idea is just this putting these two expeditions together that happened a hundred, a hundred years almost in between them. And I think what interests me was the fact that you could understand better what was happening in 2016 if you understood w what was done in 1920s. So I think your question you're asking is how you move forward is, I think this is a reflection of what expo scientific exploration has meant in the past, how it means right now. And I think it opens a question about the future, like why do we keep going to these places? 
why is it relevant, why we have to keep doing this, or we don't have to keep doing this. And I think in that sense, it becomes relevant to think about the kind of the bigger context of, of why these things are being done. I, I think it becomes very relevant. I think there's something interesting about um, two different w ways I found the word future be co complicated. One is that um, if you ask of the, what they think of when they think of the future, their mind goes blank usually. The, what comes back is uncertainty or so in that sense um and then but then when actually you, when we've talked about scenarios more and often then the word future becomes useful because it um creates a, some kind of break supposed break between the what people see perceive as being possible in the present uh and what they what the space of the imagination offers but actually what they're really doing is doing what you're describing is recompositing the present in a more imaginative way, but the word scenario allows you to have a space that's that's um, imaginative and forward-looking in that alternative sense without being predictive, and, and and sort of creating a separation between the predictive and the and the building of scenarios also feels quite important in order to open up that space. I don't know how that relates to how you how it works in architecture, but that's certainly what I found in my work. I think there is a there is a problem, right? Because I I believe that the way we understand history and time was has been so far white, Western, and male. So progress, development, you know, the idea of of going forward, right? And was constructed through a very binary colonial system of values, of <coughs> of understandings, of of of, uh, of progress, if you want. Right? And there was a kind of uh, you know almost like teleological belief in in development. I think in an era of, of, of climate, environmental injustice and climate change, we cannot think that like that anymore. It's over. So I don't know if we should think about the impact to the future, or we should ask the question, what's the right from the future to what we're doing today, right? I mean, it's, we, we, are, we shouldn't measure our act, actions, um, I mean, the impact of our actions in a way. We should actually ask the opposite question. You know? How how our actions would be measured in the future. You know, it's like a, I think it's a, it should be a very different uh, way of understanding time and linearity also. Mm -hmm. So we have to be, and I think it has been done anyway, especially in environmental studies and, and gender studies. And we should do it in architecture as well. But also, is, I, I think uh, following on that is to define the particular problem Day because otherwise, I mean, we talk about climate change or the environmentalism or the environmental problem, but uh, um, it's not the same as it was 50 years ago or 30 years ago, uh, and won't be the same in 10 years' time. So I guess we need always to be a bit more precise what exactly means climate change now, what that uh, encompasses. Um, what are the questions or the problems or the, the urgency we need to respond to? And that's why I said about engaging more with the now, that uh, uh, understanding the problem within all its parameters and all its implications now, as it is now. Mm -hmm. Not as used to be or it, it may be, because I don't think no one can uh, really predict that, and also, especially in this uh, context. Yeah, and I, and I also think that um, uh, what might look like a prediction is already happening somewhere for mm. some people, like mm. both depend, like I was saying, on awareness and on the actuality of what's happening in different mm. parts of the world. The, the mm. Time is kind of getting more complicated in terms exactly. of what counts as the mm. present and, mm -hmm. and, the, and the climate crisis actually exacerbates or makes more extreme mm -hmm. that situation. So because it's not happening at the same rate in the same way mm -hmm. everywhere and it's very much bound up in the kinds of inequalities that you're Mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. and so one person's future is another person's present is another person's mm -hmm. past in relation to that question i mean and that, that's all happening now mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i guess this is what we were starting to try to indicate with this matrix of 99 problems is mm -hmm. rather than because i guess the problem is always seen right now in this language of efficiency you know everybody seems to have problems like back problems mental health problems I don't know, money problems. So I guess it's always considered in the language of efficiency currently. Like when you have a problem, you need to c 
consider already this, the immediate solution for that. So what this problem matrix was trying to do is to actually first understand what are the questions and to understand that there is a complexity about these questions that is in relation to time and to where you live and to basically <laughs> first state, be, become much better at asking the right questions rather than providing quick solutions. So it's, it's, I think that's also mm -hmm. maybe part of this is how you, how you classify actually how, what are the many problems that we have and one man's problem is maybe another man's opportunity. So there's also, yeah, I guess something about that. I'd be really interested to hear more about the, this, this model of relational um, structure. I, I think that's also related to what you're just describing as a problem as an individual. Mm -hmm. Like, it comes back to the individual. What, mm -hmm. does it, what does it look like and what is it called when it's operating within a... Right, um, just um, yeah, when I talk about the relational um, or we say, we say associational relationship, it's, it's really deeply embedded in the Chinese culture where... Um, I don't think, if, if I say in a, in a really simplistic way, I don't think the individual subjectivity exists in China. It's always about collective subjectivity. So like, to give you a super simple example, like in the um, collectivization era, when people meet each other, they don't say, how are you? They say, which work unit you're from? So this is a way to say hello, this equals hello. So this already shows how the identity is identified in society. And in that way, there's a very particular space produced because of this social relationship. And that, and I argue that that type of space is still working, partially working today, which means um, like the word community has a very specific administrative meaning in China, but it's totally different here. And then, as you said, like, um, when we consider the future, like there, there are different parts of the world, and then it's not just like different parts. Maybe here is the uh, future that that is a path. Somehow, it's like goes in circles. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like somehow what we what the China has in the collectivization era might be some sort of future in Western countries. Yeah, I think we certainly need to learn a form of symbiosis and, 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 and how, to, um, how to understand what success looks like in a non-linear, non-competitive, mm. non-kind um, of individually structured model, which is something I think is really complicated in the current environment. So that there's the underlying structures, there's a lot talked about other ways of doing things, mm. but the underlying structures within which that's done is, remain the same. And mm. That's why it's really interesting to hear mm. about other models, how this mm. has worked in the past and now. Yeah, I mean, I, I might be the wrong person from that perspective because my projects take way longer than most people's in the theatre. Like, but even so, much less probably than major architectural um, projects. But it's interesting how when you're trying, like I suppose I'm try, I keep trying to make work about what it means to be alive now and, and then what that constitutes kind of ch changes often. At the moment, it's changing faster than... Um, the, uh, the ability to kind of respond to it perhaps, but I think something I, I, I was, it's, I mean, I'm sure this is a, a story from 
architecture that all of you already know, but I was really struck by it when I came across it as part of this project, which I think is sort of illustrative of, of a kind of flexibility within the imaginative models that theatre produced um, in different ways, but it is bound up with buildings, which is um, the way that houses are now built with kitchens that where you can't really cook your own food because of, you know, people have processed meals, they don't need space to cook, and you're kind of, well, you're building into the architecture of the future, the, the incapacity, the like, spatial as well as cultural to actually change that model of how we live, which we radically and rapidly need to do. So it's, it was a real, for me, like a really, I keep thinking of these kitchens that in which you can't cook as being a kind of model for, for a, a, a how we kind of build into our, culture ways of doing things that are fundamentally unsustainable um, and um, but it's true in the theatre as well like we have theatre buildings and you know there's a sort of fashion for for other ways of doing things but actually conventions whether it's a physical built convention or a or an invisible cultural convention structure our thinking and structure our, our modes of operation and they're difficult to get out of so and, and when you are model, trying to model it differently, you have to kind of think of everything because you have to provide a different set of rules by which to live, operate, play. So if you, as soon as you move the boundaries of the convention, you can't just take them away. <coughs> people will try and find what the rule is instead. And if you don't provide that, then, then people are either very confused or they come up with their own rules that weren't what you were expecting, which is sometimes delightful. <laughs> you kind of, how do you, yeah, I, I, I don't know that there's, I guess, yeah, it's about time scales, but I'm not sure that the underlying um, issues are necessarily that different. I was interested in Lu Luis uh, sort of describing this question in of 100 people to as a sort of section of time, because I think that brings, brings a light the idea of the, the complexity of the now, like, you know, what's now for so many people. And I wanted to ask you a bit more maybe about, you know, I think that the, the most, for me the most appealing thing is th the decisions you made to put that together. Because uh, I, I don't know the, the, the reference word, but I'm, I'm interested to know a bit more about, you know, if you actually send this to only 100 people and the sort of, a bit more how you decided, you know, how that, it was it only architects, you said it was a number of friends, because I think that gives a better sense of the work you're producing is kind of uh, what, it, mm. what it is reflecting. It was a mix, so it was architects, like a lot of architects, but also non-architects, like doctors, lawyers, software developers. Um, of course, it was very subjective because it was our friends. And um, we also said from the beginning that this project was only intended to exist in people's email inboxes. So it was never meant to be published, um, which is something that we have discussed many times, whether that is good or a bad thing and what this means. But I think ultimately it meant that people could be very frank, very honest in their answers. Also, some people responded within hours and some people took months. So there was a real difference in let's say, immediacy or consideration. And in a way, by, I think, collecting the material, in a way, we did very minimal. We just wrote a simple introduction to, uh, to explain what motivated us to do this. And then we compiled a kind of fact sheet of where people were from, what their jobs were, how far apart people lived, to understand the scope of it. And then we send it to each contributor, which meant actually all the people that participated formed a mini temporary institution in themselves. There was never an actual dialogue between them because they never got to talk to each other, but we were sort of the thought collectors that facilitated this exchange. So I think the question is how, how do we move on from this? Because this, I guess, was an experiment, but then you know, we are already thinking what is the what is maybe, what could be the next step? Because really for us, this 100 minds is like a, it's almost like, because we, we consider it as a survey, but not in the sense of like, what is your favorite city to live in survey, but in the sense of really extracting the knowledge that is ingrained in the city and in people's minds and laying it open. So it's an 
it's an ongoing thing. It's like a living entity. And we were really inspired by this actually Scottish urbanist and biologist. He's called Patrick Geddes. And he, he says the city and the survey, they are one. They are one ongoing thing. And as the city evolves, so does the survey. So that's why, actually, I don't see this as a closed chapter, but really like at the first episode in many events that are supposed to reveal what people are interested in. But maybe the first one was incredibly subjective because it was our friends and it was their, their subjective ideas about the city because also the questions were asked in a very subjective way. So the, the question is, how can we maybe expand, reach out, and at the same time change the way we ask the question to, to trigger other responses? Yeah. So it's, it's, that's the thing with the present. Or it's ongoing in our case. It's like a, a living entity and always needs to be updated. This is already out of date, two years ago. Mm -hmm. I read through it again and yeah, it's, it's prophetic, <laughs> most of it. I mean, yeah. Perhaps at, at this point, I would like also to introduce um, or to highlight another um, aspect, um, the aspect of communication and language, because um, you said that it's constantly ongoing, it's ongoing mm -hmm. experiment, mm -hmm. or we update it mm -hmm. all the time. Um, and I think language is a highly unstable system too. So we we talk about forward or the future or binaries or uh, subjective uh, or collective forms of collectivity, but we still use kind of the same uh, terms or the city. Um, and just I would like more to open that uh, as a, as a question because we do communicate, we do use uh, multiple languages, can be words, can be uh, lines, whatever said, can be um, uh, drawings, images. Uh, so we, we do work through and we do communicate and we, our practice actually is these multiple languages. So that's another thing perhaps one has to um, reconsider um, as part of that um, kind of uh, thinking about forward or about present. Can I make a, mm -hmm. specific, I had a, a, a very specific um, experience, I think, of maybe what you're um, thinking about, which is in the project that we made, We Know Not What We May Be, we gave um, the audience scenarios to think about. Well, they're postcards with propositions on them, all based on different um, propositions for different economic uh, kinds of structures and change. At first, they were called, well, for a while, they were called policies. This is stuff. Then they were called ideas. They really were ideas. But what we found was that what we wanted people to do was imagine what it would be like if they became reality. That was the purpose of the project. But the word idea mm -hmm. produced a kind of block. I mean, we're already in this you know, capitalist, realist mm -hmm. environment where you know, the notion of there is no alternative and it's not possible. It's kind of quite present. Um, but the word idea also produces, I think, uh, the invitation to critique a kind of critical discourse that unpicks something rather than mm. produces an imagined space of, the, of, the, of, a, of an alternative and a way of doing something. And that, so then we called them scenarios, which is kind of like a mistake in the sense that it's, that's not what, the, they, are, they weren't really scenarios yet. Mm. Um, but by, by kind of misapplying the term, we helped move, like helped our, our our audiences and ourselves move into a space of the imagination. So there was a kind of way in which we kind of, yeah, pushed the terminology slightly inappropriately in order to kind of create a different kind of space that would move from a kind of critical structure, which felt like it was actually back, moving backwards into a space that felt like it was moving forwards into this space of alternative possibilities. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that kind of speaks to what you're... Yeah. Yeah. Just quickly follow um, Marina's comments. I think... The, the language is really important in terms of like the um, like translation mm. and interpretation can be super crucial like in the context you described. It's not just like tr uh, translation between different like um, languages of from different countries. It's also from different like social sectors, mm -hmm. like what pr pr uh, Plato mentioned, like uh, male, female, and um, and white, no white, yeah. Western, no Western. So I think that's like really it's a key. Mm -hmm. um, to 
you too. Thanks. Listen, can I ask our fifth speaker a quick question? Um, could your observation that uh, the competitive nature of architecture as opposed to the collective, will it make your Ford conference of 100 minds tragic or epic? Would it? The last sentence again, would it? <laughs> if, if you believe that there is a competitive nature in architecture, mm -hmm where society celebrates the individual's precedent for self-satisfaction over collective good, mm -hmm. will your forward conference of 100 minds, is that going to be tragic or epic? I think very depressing, probably. Mm -hmm. I think it will be a very, but that's okay. I think it's, it's okay to, I think the, the collection or the matrix, whatever it will produce of problems, might end up being incredibly sad and depressing, but probably also very just and very honest, and I think that's maybe okay because there there will be no there will be no answers, and for that reason, it it yeah it most likely will be a, a possibly a negative negative event, but not I don't know yeah we'll, we'll have to see what the contributions are, but I think it's it's okay I I expect that. Um, um, yeah, I think it's it's possibly us together figuring out what the the real questions are at different scales. You know, what is your personal, what is your most pressing issue personally, but then what do you think concerns us, and then what do you think is the biggest issue that you are concerned with globally? I think there are different issues that exist at different scales, and I think that's maybe one way to approach it and to allow for different media to be submitted, you know. You don't have to write or send an image. You can send a video, you can come and speak to. I, I really think it would be like a, a day clinic for one day that we collect, like a one day event where I, I sit somewhere in a public space and I, you can just drop all your problems and then you will end up with 9,999 problems. Do you, do you see end. yourself as a psychiatrist or an architect? No, because, <laughs> well, if, no, actually, if I, if I was a psychiatrist, it implies that I know more than you, and I, I don't want to be in that position. So I'm more of a collector, but maybe, yeah, I think I'm a collector, because if I say I'm a psych, if I, I would be an architectural psychotherapist, I would, it would mean that I could be able to help you, yeah. but I, I don't think I am. So are you predicting a tragic outcome? I hope it would be a productive outcome in a weird way, because I'm, I hope that through the collection of all of these uh, problems that we are able to produce this big. Honestly, I can't tell you what the, what the exact format would be, but I'm imagining a big problem matrix of sorts. Or maybe there might be a, a problem finding party at the end or some form of something that relates back to, basically by the end you have even more problems than you had before. So both tragic and epic. Yeah. I, <laughs> I don't think it can, it doesn't need to be, it can be humorous at the same time without being silly. I think it, I think it's quite serious. I'm quite serious about this. And so I think as long as, you know, you are serious about what you submit and I'm serious about bringing it into a format that enables us to compare and, and classify. And this is the thing that with Geddes that I'm really excited about, really interested in. He was a biologist, so he made all these matrices of how he understood the city and the relationship between people and their responsibilities. So he was really into categorizing and classifying things as a means, as a first means to understand. So I, I don't think I can help you in any way. And I, I don't mean that, I don't know if it's wrong that I'm I'm abstaining from providing any solutions, but I really do believe that first, before we are even going there, because the problem is already so complex and there are so many variations of that, I think it'd be quite good to first see it all in front of us. And then from there we can move on. You know, it's a living entity, as I said, so then we can, in the next episode, we can think about the solution. It's weird. Making aware of, yes. Yeah, I think so. I think it's, I think it's, yeah. It's too easy to say yes, no, and this is important to me, and this is important here, but it's, it's understanding the complexity of 
all the problems that, that you have and somewhat forming a consensus or not in that. Yeah. Other, other questions? Um, hello. So I was just wondering if the date of, like, you all speak with um, a bit of urgency about the concept of the future, particularly in terms of the environment, etc. Um, but if the expiration date on the sort of statements that can be said is so short um, now, how can we um, sustain, like, an effective conversation about the future? How can you um, make statements which don't expire so quickly or in formats that aren't so limited by the time, how can we continue the conversation? Well, I think I, I, you're, I, sorry, sorry. No, no, just one sentence. I think you're living through it. We're all living through it. That's the way to go. No. Um, and also if it's predictive, then, it, then there's an expiration date. But if it's explorative or, or imaginative, that's not quite the same. It's that out of, Stepping out mm. to be in time that you were talking about, that I think gives you that space of the imagination that then doesn't run, run out as such. But it's only if you kind of go, next week, this is going to happen, or next year, this is going to happen, then, then you're kind of, yeah. But otherwise, I, think, I don't think it's, like I said, I think everything's that uneven anyway, so there isn't a kind of single present from which to speak. <coughs> But do you think that that question is relevant to now, to our time, or it, it has always been? I think it probably is relevant to all time, but I think because, in a sense, the way that we consume media and information is so much faster, mm -hmm. you can change what you're saying so much quicker. Like um, the person just to your right, mm -hmm. I think, was saying that like something you did in 2016, it's kind of like prophetic, but somewhat like... You have to do it again now, but how could you, like, yeah, so that's sort of what my question was directed at. Like, of course, this is a problem that always happens, read the future. But, like, in a time which is so fast, how can you catch up or make valid statements sort of thing? Not to be, like, critical, just, like, generally, how do I do it, too? <laughs> yeah. I know I said it's outdated, but somehow many of the things that were said are also timeless, which is, so it means that they are very present, so it's, it's, it's the way you read it. Of course, many things refer to political changes or uh, TV shows that were on, the, at, on at the time, and you understand that it's from 2016, but maybe it's also not so relevant, because you can also read it and um, take something from it that is, that is still relevant today. I just think it means we have to keep doing those things. I, I'm not, I don't feel stressed about time, in a way. I'm, I, I, I don't need to, like, I don't feel, I, somehow it's okay to, I don't know, I, I, if you just keep going, and if you continuously survey and interrogate, I think, I don't think there has to be an outcome. Or get, you know, these get-togethers that I mentioned, there's like 45, 33, 16, I mean, I think it's a, there can be moments in time where you get together, you exchange, and then you, you also keep doing, you don't need to exchange constantly. I don't, also don't know if that is so productive or so revealing. I don't know, maybe there is something in abstaining and then exchanging, and maybe there's an intensity to it if it doesn't have to be continuous. I think in regards to that question of the media, the way which we absorb and the format that information comes to us, can also serve as a, under, it's a reflection of the culture we're living in. So I think it's, there's no answer to what's the way of approaching it, but I think there, there needs to be a critical <coughs> understanding of the way that that information is received, but the, also the way that it's produced in, uh, in contrast to how other information used to be produced. So I think it becomes uh, relevant in the question of the understanding the specificity of the media and how it is, it is uh, communicated or how it echoes across the world. Yeah, it was, yeah, Marsha McCullen talking about the, the, the idea of the, the, me the media and the message, and I think that, that sort of addresses a bit the question of understanding the medium with which we communicate. Uh, I 
have a question in regards to the collective nature of life in China. So my question is basically you were saying that it's possible that in the future the West could learn from that collective nature of living and kind of conform to it as well in opposition to the individual. But my question is then is there also a chance that China could also take something from the individual nature of life in the West and if it would, would this be negative or positive in comparison to the past and the present of the Chinese collectivity now? Yeah, I think um, it would be wrong for me to say who learns from whom. It's always like an interactive way, like how these um, different cultures work. Um, like, for example, we, we don't even need to talk about like um, individual collectivity or collective um, subjectivity, just in terms of like architectural education in China. For example, during my education in China, we taught, try to think through the dichotomy between the public and the private. And then through that, we realized it's at, like after like 10 years, I realized actually this pair of terms cannot explain the space and the people's life in China. And then I realized probably there needs to be like a Chinese own term to, to, to define that. But I would say to even to try, try to think um, through the public versus the private was actually also productive. So that's also uh, what I meant by saying that um, to put in forward a critical position doesn't have to be confrontational, it can be relational. That's what I meant by relational. And so to answer your question, sure, yes, it's definitely it's a two-way process. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually just wanted to pick up on a, a point that from uh, your question earlier about whether you're a psychiatrist or an architect, and also something that Patricia said uh, in your presentation where you talked about architects as the as intersection of disciplines. And I was quite curious as to what each of you saw as your role in kind of taking things forward, um, avoiding the... Men avoiding mentioning the word future. <laughs> um, but I think it's quite interesting to think of whether it's the role of the architect or of the kind of the, the designer behind these things. How do you work with other disciplines? How do you ensure that the conversation is moving forward? I think what I noticed across all the presentations was how much you work with people outside of your own profession, whether it's uh, like all your images for artists or geographers, working from different contexts, um, working with participation with audiences, inviting different networks, and then also working with theory. So I was quite curious if maybe to, to close the formal part of this evening, um, uh, if each of you could maybe comment a bit on where you see your role at, is in taking things forward. Um, I think um, uh, having these conversations within an educational environment, uh, 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 gives us a specific privilege, actually it gives us time to think about these things. I think that, um, I mean, our role, I mean, the education and educational environments and institutions are probably the last spaces that we have to actually go slow and think about specific problems. Uh, and I would even, I would some, somehow underline that what we should think in this, uh, yeah, a space like the AA or any other university with, all, with its own power relations and asymmetries and, and problems that are within it, right? Um, it gives us the time to think about the kind of fundamental diagrams that define design practices or interdisciplinary practices. So, you know, we talk very often about urban or architectural forms, but we should also talk about, you know, fundamental diagrams of modernity, family, gender identity, labor, all these things, right? That somehow um, we take it for granted. I mean, somehow we, we experience spaces and we experience these diagrams as they're given to us somehow, and they are somehow internalized through, you know, social and political and, and, and parameters and practice. So I think if there is something that we can do as educators and researchers, it's actually to use our time that an institution like a university allows us to actually do research slowly and to resist this incredible speed of proliferation of media, of staff, of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary research. I mean, all these things are good, but at the same time, we should actually focus on uh, some very simple problems, right? 
and not look for solutions, but actually think through the problem. And why on earth we still live in flats that have three bedrooms, mom and dad in one bedroom, children separated in sexes, kitchen is there, a corridor is there, a toilet is there. I mean, I, I mean, why do we still produce? I mean, the market practice produces this type of flat for everyone all over the world. Is it still relevant? Who lives like that? I mean, for example, just to say, to pose a very simple question, maybe we have to produce this type of domestic environment, but maybe we should really think about it. And I think the institution gives us this opportunity, which is a privilege, you know? social and uh, political privilege. I see the, my role as bringing things together. I think, as I mentioned, I like to be a bit outside of what I'm trying to work with. So I think there's, there's a potentiality of collaborating with other people that do other things. And I think then this coming together, there's real value. And maybe we can do this as architects because I believe in, in the architect's ability to communicate things. So I think the, there's, for me, it's more exciting or more interesting when I get to enter another sort of sphere of work and try to bring in something there and also take something out. So I believe my, my f future or my forwardness is about getting involved with different people and actually in this exchange of different things kind of giving something in that it's unexpected maybe. Um, I think I'm actually inspired by the title of this talk, like four words. And as you mentioned in the email, this, uh, this is in fact the first lecture of the, the whole public program this year. So I guess this event itself already sends out a quite clear message, like in terms of this, this institution, this school, just that four words. And also the second interesting thing is this series called Petitions, right? So I guess that's quite something I think important for, um, like for the role of architects to, um, maybe I guess the, 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 um, the most important thing I learned that here is actually trying to take a position, just have a position. It doesn't matter what the position is and be aware of other positions and other people's position around you. And that in that way, probably we can um, deal with the, um, like the uncertainty or anxiety of how to move forward. Yeah. I think what I'm trying to, uh, all the work that I make and the collaborations I work with, what, we, what we're often doing is modeling or kind of rehearsing or yeah, but taking time out to go slow in a certain way that is actually outside the academic environment, but in this kind of performance theatrical environment where it doesn't matter. So I often describe the work that I make as pre-political, well, even though often it is dealing with what other people consider to be political subjects, because it's not asking you to take a position actually as yet. It's like opening up a space for conversation in which commit, it's like the space of play is a space of pre-commitment that you do not have to commit, you can take on another way of being. And that, in a way, is a kind of modeling that allows you to rehearse different ways of, of, of thinking about the world um, before you then hopefully go out there and commit to something. Um, I think I would somehow like to go back to this competitive nature of the profession and how a simultaneous survey of, an, an, a simultaneous ongoing survey of the, the present or the status quo could possibly infiltrate the way we operate. So at a time when architects, when planners, when developers are busy with scheduling, financing, and organizing and building, what is the potential of, uh, let's say, a, a new survey which, which could, uh, let's say, create a new repertoire to infiltrate, to influence, and to tweak those processes. So I'm quite interested in the simultaneity between what we are currently doing and how we could manipulate these processes by understanding better what we are actually doing. Yes. I think I'll uh, repeat some of the things we just heard. I mean, uh, definitely we are within uh, um, a school uh, 
and therefore we have the um, luxury to sit here and uh, contemplate and speculate and post the questions. Uh, but I, I see that as a very important task and we should take that um, as seriously. It's not just delaying uh, the engagement with reality. I think it's, it's the only way to position and by position, I don't mean to state something, to state an opinion, to, um, to uh, choose, but by position, I mean more to find a way of thinking and relating. And I think that's a very, um, as you said, it's a very important and very critical practice. And um, it's something that while also you have to find ways to expand that, to expand on that and see how we can bring that outside. I mean, we are talking about bringing things from the outside in, within the discipline, uh, which is one thing, uh, and find uh, forms of collaborating and um, um, forms of arranging or uh, um, articulating these arrangements. But I think it's also very important to find ways to bring the inside to the outside. Because we, constantly, we think that we, the school is to uh, abstain from reality and then uh, speculate. It's a, a, a space for specu pure speculation, but actually it's quite interesting to see how we can bring that uh, into the outside. Definitely, I think that's a great point to end on because I think the whole point of making these conversations public is um, to generate that conversation that then can go beyond this room and beyond the school. But it was also, the idea behind the series was to bring people from different parts of the school, people from beyond the school to come together and debate there are different approaches, ideas, and uh, it was no coincidence that we started with forward as our first position. But um, I think it's actually set up the series in a really great way. The next one is on Monday, um, a week from today, and it will look at the position of being recursive um, or these cycles of change, which actually through talking about time, we've actually started to talk about today. So I hope you'll all join us for that one. And uh, a huge thank you to all our six speakers. And uh, I hope you can all stick around for a drink, yeah. which should be served in that room very shortly, and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and continue this conversation informally. And we'd like to thank you for <laughs> coordinating. <laughs>